All right, man. So, uh, first off, let's talk a little bit about your single. Times 10. Yeah, it just dropped uh, the 18th of January, available on all digital formats. Um, it's entitled Time 10 featuring Lil Baby. Uh, I just thought coming back this time around, I'm 31 years young. I've always had like the love records uh, or the records about messing up and trying to fix it. You know what I'm saying? And be remorseful about it. I just want to do something a little more risque, a little more bold and direct and confident. And um, records working such as like When We for Tank has opened that gate open now for R&B that's deemed adult contemporary to be back mainstream. So it's just a bold, unessential record that, you know, the feedback's been crazy this past week. And salute to the QC family for rocking with me. And shout out to Lil Baby, too, for being a part of it. Right, so break down the concept of the record. What, what is yeah, that? Yeah, it's just about providing pleasure. You know what I'm saying? It's a sex record, of course, but it's just saying that I'm going to provide that service times 10. Um, I'm a Pisces, so I'm a pleaser, you know what I'm saying, in that room of my life. So... Uh, again, it's a different side of me that I never really showcased to the fans. I have sex records on all my projects, but it never was the forerunner or the front record that we went out with on the rollout. But I wanted to come back really on a different way. All right, so my team and I, on the way down here, we were talking about, you know, pleasing your partner and, yeah. and certain things that do's and don'ts. You know, when you're in a relationship, when you're, in, uh, when you're married, uh -huh. some things that sometimes lines get drawn. Okay. And when you're in a situation where you're in a relationship, you know, for you in particular, okay. what are some things that you may say no to, if any? In the department of sex? Absolutely. Um, now, really, I mean, I'm a pleaser, so if I'm in a relationship, it's whatever, except that now I've had a threesome before and all that's cool. I wouldn't want to do that with the girl I'm with, though. You know, I don't want her to ever have to envision me sexing nobody or bearing witness to that. Um, I've had a lot of fun. I've been singing my entire life and traveling the world and just experience in life you know what i'm saying natural things and encounters with women but the only don't is i wouldn't bring nobody else to the bedroom i think that's disrespectful to her even if she was okay with it i wouldn't want her to ever have that in her head and i wouldn't want her to think she had to do that to keep me now being somebody who's been in the business for a long time you know uh there's a lot of controversy going on right now you're talking about entertainers and things that entertainers are able to do, you know, so with you coming in the game as early as you came in, yep. you know, how does your experience been with older women in particular? Is okay. that a thing when it comes to, because you're a guy and, you know, they talk about young girls being in the mix of, of, of dope entertainers, like what, what the well, well, my, what you my, No, my preference when I was a younger guy was to mess with older women. I, I've always just been a little ahead of my time, a little more mature, even mentally. So a lot of women my age at that time from a mind standpoint, uh, couldn't stimulate me. So I always talked to older women. My mom like did cosmetology her entire life, had her own salon. So I spent a lot of days after high school listening to grown women converse about just grown shit. You know what I'm saying? And was, that's, that's, that's what I was around. So I gravitated to the more mature type. Um, I always also, I was raised the right way. So I keep my name clean. You know what I'm saying? And I stay out of things that, uh, could be detrimental to not just my career, but just to me as a, as a man, as a black man. We got it hard enough, so I try to stay out the way and make my path as smooth as possible. So when you were coming up, there was a uh, there was a time you took a, a little bit of time off from the business. Yep. And, uh, you know, how was life for you when you were going through that uh, period? Uh, I decided after, so from 99 to 2001, uh, that was the duration of time where you, I gave you I like it, crazy things I do for love from the bottom to the top, hardball, etc. Um, success came so fast for, for me, thank God. Uh, but there's a gift and a curse to that. I wasn't able to go back to like my school and be a normal kid. I wasn't able to go to the mall by myself and kick it with my homies because there's this thing called fame that comes with uh, music and, and being successful in the music industry. So um, it was as normal as possible, high school for me. Uh, played basketball two years. I was the homecoming king. Uh, I was part of the Renaissance program. I was in the choir, but um. They couldn't, when I say they, my peers couldn't understand, like, how they could go home and watch me on 106 Apart, and then tomorrow we sit next to each other in geometry. You know what I'm saying? It was a lot for them to accept. Um, but I wouldn't trade those four years for, for, for anything because that's what taught me the significance of life, which is love and passion and, and uh, unification of spirits and souls. You know what I'm saying? It's bigger than fame and monetary things for me. I need both. I like, I love to sing and create art. I really, at this point, I don't care about fame. I'm only famous because I am the talent, but that's not something I seek. It just comes with the job that I've chosen. But uh, 
my brotherhoods and my relationships that I developed back in my high school days are the ones that I hold close to to this day. So you basically, you know, you came up around a time where I was on the, the tail end of high school. Yep. Know, during that era, there was the Bow Wows and, yep. the, you know, a lot of the artists that were coming out during that time. You know, the Millennial, millennial um, Millennium Tour yeah. is coming out right now. It's about to happen or I don't know if it started already or uh-huh. not. But, uh, you know, how do you feel about not being... Um, I, I felt I just felt I felt disrespected for a few reasons. One, I was the first, not the second, third, or fourth, but the first child star of my generation of that generation. So if it wasn't called the Millennium Tour, I really wouldn't give two shits. But because it's called the Millennium Tour, I felt like I opened the window for executives to go find a Bow Wow who I feel should be a part of the tour. You have rap acts on there. You got Chingy. You have Yin Yang Twins. Them big homies. You gotta have Bow. Bow was the biggest thing, you know, of life in that time. So, um, I also believe on the on the spiritual side that what's for me is for me. So if I'm not a part of it, it's just not in the same cards. You know what I'm saying? But I would have to, if I had to guess, maybe some guys on there feel like I would take some shine away because my following is like an organic following. There might be an argument where some of those guys had bigger records, but I had bigger moments. You know where you were when I like it. Crazy things from the bottom to the top. Hardball came out. You know where you were when you should be my girl. Come with me. Kiss me through the phone came out. These are records I sing as a 31-year-old man, and now women who were young girls who used to have me on their walls and their locker, they sing it word verbatim like it came out yesterday. So that's really how I felt. I felt, and, and I'm mad cool, or so I thought, with everybody on that. You never see me in no scandal, no beef. I don't do the rah-rah. I show everybody peace and love and support for what they do. And I wish all them success. Even I hope that the tour is successful. I hope it goes all the way through, no drama, and they sell out these arenas. But it's definitely something that you shouldn't have had without at least give us the option, you know what I'm saying, to turn it down. Nobody reached out. I know Lottie. I know uh, Lloyd. You know what I'm saying? I don't call him Lloyd. No Lottie. I know Pleasure. I know Pretty Ricky. I was on a screen tour with Amarion. So if, if I had to guess, I think that some people are a little intimidated by, they call it a comeback, but the new love that I'm getting as an adult entertainer. It's hard to cross that bridge from being a child star, a teenage heartthrob, and then the man you are today, and then be taken seriously. But all my music is still charting, current. So I have catalog from 1999 to 2019. So that's 20 years of material. And um, maybe some people are intimidated by that. Speaking of hits, you know, Soldier Boy has been in the news a lot later lately. Big Draco! And one thing that uh, the people might have forgotten was <clears throat> Kiss Me Through the Phone record. Yeah. I even forgot. As soon as they mentioned it and people started going back, looking at the old records and listening yeah. to the old records, you know, that was a really big record for you too. Yeah. Um, how did you guys link up? Was that part of the label situation? No, I wasn't even. In, so I've been independent. Like, let me say this: like ninety percent of my career, the only album that came out under a major was Capitol Records, my first time. After that, Rowdy Records with Dallas Austin, and everything from here, from that point on, Star Camp Music, which is my entity, and I have an amazing partnership with Empire out of San Fran. Um, I went to a video shoot to holler at DJ Khaled, actually, trying to get like that Florida Miami alliance because I was raised there for six years. Never even ran into him, but Soldier came up to me at the shoot and was like, yo, I got this record. I sung my little version on a hook, but I don't like how it sound. I need you to come to the studio. And once our schedules aligned, I maybe took about two weeks. I pulled up on him, did it. And I still didn't know it was that big of a monster record. I thought it was cool and catchy. And uh, Kali Park reached out to my team at the time. We did the video and they leaked it on YouTube. This is before like digital streaming platforms. And it had like 500,000 views and like a few hours you know he's the king of the internet before the industry became so internet driven and next thing you know it's the top three record in the nation and we had jay leno and jimmy kimmel live in the view so um shout out to soldier for he made that play like he came up to me personally and was like i need you to pull up on me and soldier boy is one of those guys who did a lot of stuff on his own yeah you just mentioned you know you've been independent for the majority of your career yeah what are some of the pitfalls and some of the uh the positives and the negatives of being independent. Well, the pitfalls is it takes the financial burden on your pockets and your livelihood. There was many a times where I was like, ah, I'm gonna have to catch up on this mortgage because I need to shoot visuals, I need artwork, I need to pay the stylist, I need to pay this publicist, my manager getting whatever he's getting. So like, and I, I got grown man bills, you know what I'm saying? I have a house. I, I went straight to a house when I got my checks. I didn't get an apartment or a lease. Nah, I'm like, real deal, adult in it at 20 years young at the time. So, um. I guess the pitfalls is you're gonna have to take some L's and some years of 
not being financially comfortable where you would like to be because no label is fronting these millions or these hundreds of thousands or how much it takes to get your project off the ground. But then the perks is the return is all you. You know what I'm saying? You take care of your team, but the profit is all you. And then I think also, I was saying this earlier, I like to have creative control over my project. And that's not just musically. How I want to talk, how I want to look, how I want to, you know what I'm saying, be perceived as, the messages I want to convey. I have a disdain for people telling me what to do. You can advise me what to do because I don't know it all. I'm forever learning. But suffering the consequences of another man's decisions is the worst thing. There's a lot of artists that's without money and without deals because they listen to that a and or They listen to that CEO. And the CEOs don't give you a do-over. They go find another you or something that's working or if you're a tax write-off. I understand that. I understand the business part of it. You can't even take that personally. So when you learn that, when you go through those things, I need destiny in the fate of my own hands. I'm not giving it to nobody else. You know what I'm saying? I am the talent. I have the vision. So that's the blessing that when it works, it was something that you believed in before anybody else believed in. And once you see it all the way through and it starts to manifest and win, you're forever in control of your own destiny. Now, being someone who came up around a time when the internet really started picking up. And from then into now and seeing how things have changed and how people have changed, yeah. how do you feel about social media being an artist? I love it. That's what brought me back. It wasn't the typical, yo, management or lawyers set up this meeting and this A&R, we're going to play them three songs and they're going to love it when we get signed. That's not how it happened for me. The Shade Room gave me their platform for a few hours and that led to an onslaught of opportunities. And now that's led to three consecutive chart topping projects, a tour with my idol tank. I'm on my fourth project and I just been kind of like floating. It don't even feel, I mean, it's work, but it's not hard work. First of all, I'm doing what I love to do. And then secondly, I see it so clearly. Like this album, I'm already thinking about the fifth. I'm already thinking about the next business venture because my mind doesn't stop clicking because I'm nowhere near where I want to be. And people would think that I'm supposed to be satisfied. Hell no. Like, I used to think once I got this amount of money, I'll be cool. Nah, I want more. Or once I hit number one on the charts, I'll be cool. Nah, I want to do it again. And I want Grammys, not just the nomination. So every day I'm hungry. And social media is what brought me back. I got direct contact with my consumers. They let me know how I need to look, what songs work. They rock with my tats. The beard, the braids, they made me this. You know what I'm saying? Although I was just becoming, they okayed it. They stamped it. And they're your direct feedback. They're your A&Rs. They, they help you with your imaging. You know what I mean? They're just, if you really, really pay attention to it like that, if you study it, I don't post just to post. Everything is calculated. I know when I'm giving you too much music, oh, I need to be a little silly. I'm a spiritual person. Let me talk about God and how great he's been to me. I really have like a balance and a, and a calculated uh, delivery when it comes to social media. And ironically, that's the app that brought me back. Do you get, uh, do you ask for advice from your fans when you're working on music? Um, when I first came back, yes. Uh, because they chose the record I'm Him as the return single from a mainstream standpoint. So I was like, what made them gravitate to this? Because I've been leaving snippets on Instagram. Well, one was the platform that was allotted to me, the Shade Room. But two, I knew people still wanted real R&B. They didn't want just this auto-tune, hip-hop oriented stuff that's going on. You know what I'm saying? That's cool too. But all women want to be loved. Or if you fuck up, all women want you to be sorry about it. You know what I'm saying? Not like, well, I'm a man. This is, you know what I'm saying? They really want to see some type of remorse and some compassion. That's what we're built out of. But men started feeling like they're not masculine if they show the emotional side. Drake can do it, though. And we see how huge he is. If I was an R&B, if he was an R&B singer, that would be the epitome of what R&B is supposed to be. If I was a rapper, I would be Drake. So why do we have to go to Drake, who's a hip-hop artist, to get that emotion and that message across? So it opened up a lane for me. And that lane's been open for like over a decade. Because every interview I do, they ask like, how do you feel about the state of R&B? It's just now getting back to a great place with LMA and her, Daniel Caesar, when we working for Tank, et cetera. So um, feedback initially from a creative standpoint when I first came back was about the fans being included. Now I genuinely know, and I still think there's an art of having some mystique and uh, exclusivity with my material. So this album, I didn't share any snippets. I kind of am 100% certain um, what they want from me. And then the success and just the feedback in a week's time from Times 10 to let me know I'm on the right path.
So we're we're looking at a full length LP. Thirteen or? songs. Yeah, yeah. March first, uh, my birthday, we released my fourth album to the world, and it's entitled Everlasting. Okay. Aside from the album, uh, what's your lyric year looking like? Um, I, I partnered with like As I Am last year, hair product line and beard line, uh, as well as curls. I really want to ink a solidified situation of like exclusive for the company just because, you know, um, that's really become a part of me from an image standpoint, my, my hair and my facial hair. I'm always being asked like what products I use, et cetera, et cetera. So that's something I want to lock in. Um, a liquor sponsor, I party a little bit, you know what I'm saying? I have my little preferences and what I like to do to turn up a little bit and, and enjoy the atmosphere. So that's something I want to do. Um, I want to open up a lounge. I want a restaurant. My siblings, they actually like have masters and majors and um, culinary rather. So uh, just diversify myself, not just from a monetary standpoint to have different realms of revenue, but I believe I embody what it takes to be an entrepreneur and a mogul in the game. You know what I'm saying? Like, I respect Diddy. I respect Jay-Z. Those people that took music and made something else so special from that empire. So music is just a platform and a gateway to do everything else that I was put on this earth to do. And I'm, I'm young enough and in my prime, I feel like we're just entering my prime to execute all those things simultaneously. Now, will these be the first projects that you delved into after outside of music? Yeah, because before, um, I, I feel like you could be a jack of all trades, but a master of nothing. So I wouldn't be a great uh, salesman on a liquor or a product line if I'm not master if I hadn't mastered music yet. And I understand I'm an artist and singer songwriter first. So I need to master this and now that I've, I can do that in my sleep. I can create an album in no time. I can create an EP and it, it won't be nothing just rushed. It'll be a great body of work. Now that I'm so like sure in that, I can diversify myself and put my energy and give it my all. Okay, so um, you know, how can people find you on social media? Uh, Instagram, Twitter, and my website is all cohesive, Sammy, always, S-A-M-M-I-E-A-L-W-A-Y-S. And my Facebook and my Snapchat is Sammy Lee Bush. That's S-A-M-M-I-E-L-E-I-G-H-B-U-S-H.